Am I talking loudly enough? Can all of you hear me? What I have to say seems not to be easy to comprehend. Yet it's very, very simple. It's so simple as to be unbelievable. And it's a simplicity that would hide it and unveil it. Now, first of all, if I may, let me tell you that I don't know anything that you don't know. And I'm not standing up here as though I were some sort of an instructor. Because gosh knows I am not that. And by the same token, neither are you a student who doesn't know. It's the belief that one is a student who doesn't know that would preclude the recognition of the fact that he is life that knows already. And it is the grand egotistical position that one is an instructor that looks out and sees an aspect of perfection that he thinks needs teaching. And so I began simply by saying that uh, I'm not a teacher and you're not a student. I don't know anything that you don't know. And in order to have this make sense, I might say that, that for instance, if you were to walk up and stand in front of a mirror, you would only see an image of yourself there, but the authority would be in the looking in the mirror and not out there with the image. Now, that doesn't mean that the image can't tell you something. That doesn't mean that the appearance there doesn't tell you that you maybe need to comb your hair or to wipe your dirt off your nose or to straighten your, your clothing or something. But nonetheless, the authority lies here as <laughs> the awareness that listens and not out there with the image. Now, right here at the minute, it, it would have seen that you look out and see one that you call Bill Samuel, who supposedly has something to tell you. The very, very simple truth is that awareness or life is just listening to itself. And it is forever doing just that. At every minute, it's doing just that. The now is simply an ever-unfolding self-disclosure. And that's what's going on right here, right now. So let's dismiss this idea of personality. You know that down on Hollywood Boulevard or somewhere there in Hollywood, there's a place where a whole bunch of clocks are in there. This fellow's got a million clocks in the room, and these pendulums are swinging in all directions. And uh, so it seems that as people get together, just like an orchestra comes together, that everybody tunes the instruments first, and there's this grand cacophony at the beginning while everybody gets in tune. And uh, so always at the beginning of a talk like this, it seems that pendulums are all swinging in different directions. And uh, so for just a few minutes, we get over this personality bit that is looking out at someone out there who supposedly knows something or going with the, the judgmental criticisms that we make or the evaluations that we make of another one out there. And if we can get that over and done with quickly, well, then we can be on about our way of seeing whatever we've got to say here or seeing what there is to, to be seen. Okay. The simple point I made was there's no teacher here and there's no student here. There's this life. And life is about the business of perceiving itself and understanding itself. And this is really the whole process. This is all that's ever going on. It's wisdom about the, the business of discovering its own infinity, its own beauty, its own perfection. And to point this point out and to make it clear, let me say again, now some of you people who have been with me for weeks will just hear me say again what you heard before. But there's an old saying in the East that nothing has been heard once until it's been heard 12 times. And it won't hurt to hear it said again. And you know what? Once there was a little girl that kept slamming the door when she went out, and the mother kept saying, don't slam the door, but the little girl just slammed it. 
And this went on for months. In fact, it went on for years. Every time she went out the door, she slammed it with a bang. And the mother would always say, don't slam the door. Well, one day she didn't. And the mother was dumbfounded. And said, how come you didn't slam the door? And she says, well, Mama, I hurt you. I finally hurt you. And so it is that we, it's true, there is a grand perfection present. And we hear it said time and again, time and again, and we hear it from many places. We look in many mirrors of the self. Those mirrors may appear to be books. They may appear to be governments. They may appear to be institutions. They may appear to be what you call teachers, labels, all labels attached to figments of your own seeing. And we listen to it and see it and hear it over and over and over until finally we hear it and see it. Now, the grand delight of my experience has been that, and I, and I don't mean to sound vainglorious about this, but for some very interesting reason, miracles, if you want to use that word, follow me around. They do. And nobody, of course, is ever more dumbfounded by it all nor amazed by it all than me. And by miracles, I mean what the world would call healings or what the world would call the perception of light or what humanity would call the sudden intuitive knowing or the mystical marriage. It goes by a million different names, but it happens. It just happens where I go. But it happened where I go because of the very experience having, it seems, having happened to me. And of course, that experience doesn't happen, to put it in a time sense, it doesn't seem to happen until one is actually earnestly about the business of looking for the truth to find out just what reality is. But by the same token, whether one is looking for what reality is or not, the action of life is the discovery of it, automatically going on, effortlessly going on, whether we're really doing it or not. You know, you touch the hot stove to learn not to touch a hot stove. And you walk across a hot pavement barefoot only to find out that sometimes you can't walk on black pavement barefoot in the hot sunshine, you better put shoes on or something. Or we wear shoes in order to find out that it's pretty darn good sometimes to go barefoot. And we, uh, so, so whether we are really about the business of looking for the truth or not, consciously looking for it or not, we are forever discovering it anyway. And what we are discovering is what we already are not something that we are trying to acquire because the truth that we're looking for is here. It's right here. It's here closer than breathing, closer than fingers and toes, and I tell you, it's here. It is here. There is nothing that anybody could want that is not already right here, right now. Now, it's here. It's not somewhere else. By way of illustration, I might point out that the alphabet is right here. An intangible alphabet is here. Who would deny that? You can't see it, you can't weigh it, you can't measure it, and yet it shows itself forth as a whole bunch of letters. But the alphabet's here. This principle is here. Whether we see it, whether we look for it, whether we know it, whether we care about it, it's here. And by the same token, the principle of arithmetic is here. The principle is here. The principle is intangible. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. You can swing all of the axes, and you can throw all of the bottles, and you can destroy all of the buildings. You can just blow the earth apart. But the principle, the principle of arithmetic remains untouched, unaffected unhurt, and the principle is perfect. It doesn't have a single error in it, a single mistake in it. It is immaculate, and it's here. It's right here, right now. And furthermore, it's all here. There's no aspect of it that isn't here. 
Now, that which shows the principal force seems to be a lot of numeral signs, symbols. That which makes the principle manifest or known to itself appears to be numerals and so forth. And they are themselves finite rather than infinite because a, a number of the principle is infinite because it's all. That is, within itself it's all. The numeral, which is like a quality or an attribute that shows it forth, is not all there is to the principle. Consequently, the numeral is finite, that is, it is measurable. It has a beginning and an end. The number three begins where number two ends, and it ends where number four begins. So it appears then to be finite. And yet that numeral, even though it's finite, it's eternal because it lasts as long as the principle lasts. And the principle, having never had a beginning, could never have an end. Consequently, we see what the metaphysician understands as a very strange paradox. He sees himself looking out at a, an eternal finiteness. <clears throat> the mystic said this first, or the, or the illumined, or the enlightened, or whatever you want to call it, said this first, and then the philosopher came along and created a philosophic system that proved it by use of reason and logic, and then finally science comes along and very laboriously proves it, tangibly proves it, so that the intellect will buy it, and lo and behold, we find out that matter really can't be destroyed, that matter is energy or light that we can change it and do all kinds of things with it, but it still winds up still being what it was if we don't get rid of the energy of the line. Okay, now that is sounded. Let's come down just a little bit. <laughs> what I've said is that there's a pure and perfect principle right here right now to be discerned. And that the awareness or the life we are is the discerning of it going on continually going on, whether we like it or not. And that all that we're concerned with is this now instant, this now moment. And that's all we've really ever been concerned with. You know, I love when all of the kids started talking about the now. I jumped up and down and clicked my heels because I said, Great, it's the truth. Why should I not see my own youthful aspect of self out there? discovering the beauty and the perfection that now is. Because the now is all we're ever concerned with. Just this now. Now, of course, the human sense of things, the body sense of things, the world sense of things, takes now and makes it the most infinitesimal nothing on the face of the earth. It makes a baloney sandwich out of it. See, it's got it wedged in. It's got the past on one hand, a very, very thick piece of bread that stretches infinitely in one direction, called the past. And then on the other hand, it's got the future that it stretches out and worries about and is concerned about. And he's guilty about the past, don't forget. Everything in the past he's guilty of and has done and has done wrong or something. And uh, I wish I hadn't done this or that. And on the other side, there's this great future about what's going to happen. Earth is being destroyed and we're getting to where we can't breathe the air and the water is becoming polluted and and we're becoming overpopulated and what's going to happen and I've got to plan and calculate and put aside so many dollars in order to take care of this and that but all the while right in between right in dead in between is a thing called now right now now and inevitably the now is always all right when we bring it right down to the right here the right now and then at the moment it would seem that the tangible here now is this room where you listen to an aspect of yourself called Bill just making an effort to, to be honest, to tell it like it is. And you'll notice that the now, when you bring it down to now, the now is always all right. The now really is always all right. It's always that worry about what's going to happen in just the next minute. Or when you look at the stack of bills, what's going to happen in just the next minute? Or when you look at the government, you're worrying about, well, what's going to happen if this trend continues? Or if you look at the past, you'll say, well, what does it teach me or tell me? Or if I had only done thus and so. But you'll notice, if you'll just stop and consider, 
just stop and consider, when do you think about the future? That is, when do you do all of this great planning and calculating about what I'm going to do next? When? When do you do it? If it isn't now. We even do our worrying now. And we hold ourselves guilty of being imperfect and impure and incomplete and gendered and uh, we do that now too. So the now is an eternal now. And it seems that the now is a ubiquitous now. It's with us inevitably being there all the time. So, when, a, when trials or tribulations set in of a personal nature, now I, for some strange reason, am picking up a sense or feeling here that, that I'm not talking to people with trials and tribulations or, or anybody trying to get rid of anything. But rather, there's a great sense of everybody here you know, attempting to understand something, which is just great. But, but let's uh, make a hypothetical thing that is not now. But for the sake of illustration or clarity, let's suppose suppose one has a great sense of agony at the moment, a sense of incompleteness, a sense of unfulfillment, a sense of a great destiny or something some great grind in the belly, that, which is the divine discontent, and is brought to his knees and is in the basement. One can always, in the twinkling of an eye, come back and say to himself, well, now, see here, now, now is the time I'm really concerned with, and this now is all right. There's nobody knocking at the door right now trying to collect the bill. There is no one trying to destroy my home right now. This now is fine. This now is all right. And it does seem that we have to make this little simple start. And this is what the kids have been smart enough to say. Now is the acceptable time. Incidentally, it's very interesting to note that every one of the religious philosophies that have ever started began with a statement, Behold, now is the acceptable time. The kingdom of heaven is at hand now. One time Jesus was asked, well, what does all of this mean, all of these signs and symbols I see in the sky? What does it mean? Tell me what it means. Tell me about prophecy. And incidentally, in, in Jewish theology, this is the holiest of all holy weeks. And today is one of the holy days. And they said, what do all these signs mean? And instead of answering the question directly, he answered it obtusely. He said, he said, perfection is even now spread over the whole face of the land, but men perceive it not. And he said, test this now. Do you know that that's in the Bible? So many people don't know it. Say, test this now. See if this now is all. Well, okay. Obviously, we look around and we see a world in great turmoil, and you can say, well, hell, fire, the now is not all right. What do you mean the now is all right? We've got a government that is becoming a bigger government. We've got people who are denying our freedoms, who are trying to take it away from us. We have great organizations that are trying to impose rules and regulations. And freedom is not now, we hear said so often. So how does one go to about testing this now? And of course, here herein comes the light about which I tried to talk, and it's so simple as to be unbelievable. And the intellect will never understand it, but the heart does. The intellect has to have everything make sense. The intellect has to listen to a talk and it has to make reasonable sense. It has to follow line upon line. It has to make progressive good sense. 
reason and logic in the religion. And the intellect says, now, at the end of this talk, if I am not lifted up or elevated, or if I didn't hear a lot, and so forth and so on, then it was no good. But the heart, strangely enough, doesn't do that. And the heart is not so obvious. The heart is a rather humble sort of a thing that we are, that, that seems to be infinitely greater than the intellect in many respects. For example, the heart and love are synonymous terms. Love sees things that the intellect can never see. For instance, how many of you have seen some big fat slob that chews cigars and, and tobacco is forever running out of the corner of his mouth and he's profane and he's forever in a, in a t-shirt and he smells like a goat and he is the crudest, coarsest thing on the face of the earth? And wherever he goes, he says the wrong thing, and yet his wife loves him with a passion. Love doesn't see all of that the world or that the intellect would say is incorrect or improper. Love just doesn't see. Love is above it and beyond. How many of you have seen a child who the world would say was retarded or was crippled or was frail but the mother and the father love that child with a delight beyond belief love doesn't see that love sees infinitely beyond now the dual nature of this thing called awareness that is right here right now listening and feeling and seeing and being. Seems to have a dual nature. Seems to. Seems very dualistic. It seems that it has its hot and cold. It has its daylight and darkness. It has its male and female. It has its right and wrong. It's correct and incorrect. It's good and evil. Seems to have its intellect and its heart. The intellect and the heart. Now, all education is predicated on the assumption that we're stupid and don't know anything, and it's aimed at an intellect to try to lift an intellect up from the dirt, from the lack of knowledge, up to some kind of smart. And uh, I, I have simply found out that that's not what it's saying. It happens to be with the heart. And I... To the best of my ability now, from this point on, rather than talk to an intellect and try to make intellectual sense, I will hopefully say what will be intellectually acceptable, but I assure you that the words are directed to a heart, to a heart, to a heart, because I know the heart understands, and the heart will hear it. And, uh, so if you'll bear with me, that's what I'll do from this point on. I would like to say that the heart does not respond as quickly as the intellect. The heart will hear something and uh, mull it over, but the heart sings when, it, when something comes along and says, this is so, this is right, this is how it is. The heart sort of sings. It's a gentle singing. And the heart is not bound to this dimension of time. The heart will hear some of these things that I'm saying, not today, but tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next month or a year from now or ten years from now. And it blooms things. So please understand that I'm not trying to lift anybody up now so that you're walking around with feet of fire or so that the healing transpires or so you'll say, hot dang, this is really inspirational. I'm not doing that at all. I want to be honest and say it like it is. I want to just tell my own story. And once again, I point out that that's really all I can do is tell my own story. That's any, all any of us can really do is tell our own story. 
But when we tell our own story, we can speak with authority because we know it. Now, what I'm going to try to say is something I know. It's what I know. It's what I've lived. And I won't be talking theory, and I won't be talking speculation, and I won't be talking what I think, but I will be telling you what I know because I've lived it, and I've lived on both sides of it, and I've lived it wrong lots of times, and made lots of mistakes, and walked down many crooked paths, and gotten tied up with all kinds of study that had, had to do with mysticism, and the psychic or religion or philosophy. I've walked down all of these paths and only to find out that there seems to be a much simpler and much narrower way, a much more direct way, and that's what I want to talk about. But I'll say it to the heart. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Those are good ones. Well, okay, now I'll be very personal and it'll sound like I'm talking personality, but I would like to tell you that there's a very, I must have been the original wanderer on the road. These kids that wander about from place to place now in search of truth, to me, this is the greatest sight I've ever seen. You know, I picked up a lad the other day. I said I had room in my car for one person, and it seemed kind of dumb to not have that place occupied with all of these people on the highway and uh, looking for a ride. And so I waited until I saw just one because I couldn't put more than one in there. And so finally I hit a lad and I picked him up and, and I said, put your gear in the front. There isn't even any room in the back. And, and uh, then I introduced myself. And, and I says, uh, what you looking for? And he says, I'm looking for reality. This lad had the brightest, cleanest, clearest, most beautiful eyes. Now, sure, you know, with his clothes were ragged and all of that. But uh, the eyes told the story. The face told the story. The feeling was emitted told the story. Here was a beautiful man that I picked up. And I says, what you're looking for? He says, reality. And I says to myself, great. And then a few minutes later, I says, what did you say you were looking for? He says, I'm looking for the truth. Well, do you know, very many years ago, I won't say how long ago, but very many years ago, this is what struck me. I wanted to know what was real. I was raised in a, in a home of Jewish heritage, but then my, my father forsook Judaism and moved into an arena of metaphysics. Some aspect of metaphysics struck him as having a great deal of truth in it. He was drummed out of the temple, so to speak. And uh, I had a mother who was vehemently and violently opposed to metaphysics uh, and didn't like it and thought it was terrible until one day it said the truth of it, the beauty of it hit her. And so here I was raised then, sort of in a, a metaphysical concept, but I could, I could never believe it. So when I went off to college, I majored in religion. Hmm. College didn't, I mean, oh, this was, seemed to be a terrible mistake because I came out ridiculously confused. And so I took off. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know. <laughs> and of course, I came out ridiculously confused for an obvious reason. It served its purpose. It pointed out that that really was not where it was. <laughs> so I took off. Well, World War II came along, and I was in it before the United States got into the war. I was in it. And, uh, well, anyway, my I made my way to the east by virtue of the fact that that's where I went. I went over to, into India where I joined this group of troops known as Merrill's Marauders. That infamous group of Americans that went tearing into the jungle only to be decimated and absolutely torn apart. Uh, if you're any of you familiar with your history, I went into Burma with Merrill. I was only in there for the very shortest time and I came out with all kinds of things. Dinghy fever that nobody knew anything about yet. 
And I was moved back to a hospital, and at this time I was wondering, well, now, why doesn't my metaphysics, why doesn't my Christian time do something about this situation? And, uh, well, this was just a wonderment. Later I went on over into China, and I was a young officer, a junior officer, and it came time to find uh, an interpreter. There was one old man as an interpreter, and nobody wanted him because we all realized that if we needed this physical agility. We needed people that could get up and down these mountains with us if we were to survive in a combat situation. I was infantry, incidentally. And uh, so being the junior officer, I got stuck with the old man. But I, one thing I noticed about this old man was that he was a little cherub. Never has there ever been more of the, the, the epitome of Buddha than this man. He was had a face as light as light. He had a countenance of cheerfulness. He was pot-bellied, and he was jovial, and he was happy, and everything was a delight to him no matter what he saw. No matter how it appeared, he was a comforter to kids. He loved people no matter what they did. He was compassionate. No matter what the sin was it was committed anywhere, he could not see any sin there for some funny reason or another. And uh, he couldn't see that anybody had really done anything wrong. He says if they've done something wrong, they'll find out. They'll be the very first one to find out, and they'll burn their fingers and find out the better way to do it. So he said, let them learn. If they don't learn now, they're going to have to learn some other time. But anyway, I noticed that everywhere he went, people were all gathered around him. And, and I, the last thing I wanted was a socialite for, a, for an interpreter. But I'm stuck with him. And I noticed that he was always a babble of words, but people would come away with great joy and enthusiasm, and kids would come away with happiness, and I just couldn't understand it. But I said, no, I'm going to lower the boom on that. I don't want anybody to be so happy. I want, to, I want him to get out, and I put him on a program of physical training. I said, now look, let's you start doing a few push-ups, and let's you do a few knee bands, and let's strengthen your legs, because we've got a lot of moms that we're going to have to walk over, and if you're going to go with me, we're going to survive. So I put him on this, ex this thing of exercise. But then while, I, while this was going on, I found out, lo and behold, I found out, and incidentally, I'm, now I'm new to the Orient. I, I had been in India, and incidentally had studied a little bit in India while I was there, had had the opportunity that is study religion. But then I'd gone into Burma in a combat situation. Now here I am in China, so I'm still really not acquainted with the Orient yet, and I couldn't believe some of the things that I saw, the cruelty that appeared to be present and the grand disregard for the welfare of others. I just couldn't understand this. The starvation that was all over the darn place and the dirt and the filth, all of these things I couldn't understand <coughs> yet. But mostly I couldn't understand what seemed to be man's inhumanity to man at this point. Well, during this week, I, well, I find out that this man has just, uh, I'm told, a week earlier, which would have been almost two weeks earlier, I guess, more, a little bit more than a week earlier, had just lost his wife and his daughter. And they had been raped to death before his eyes down in Hong Kong. Now, his wife had, he was not certain of his daughter because her body had been thrown up on a great heap of bodies, and he, was, he really felt in his heart that she wasn't dead, that she was feigning death in order to get out of there, but he managed to escape. Well, this is the story I heard. Tremendous story, isn't it? And yet here I am looking at a man ten days later, and he's the picture of joy, and he's got bright, bright, I said one day, blue eyes, and somebody says, how can you say an Oriental has blue eyes? Well, I don't know, but this man had blue eyes. Very bright and beautiful. And uh, so uh, I called him in as the arrogant intellectual, the arrogant American, the man who is, has to have everything make reasonable sense. It has to have reason and logic behind every move. And I called him in and I said, Is it true that your wife, that you lost your part of your family? And he said, Yes. And I said, 
Well, first of all, I'm sorry about it. I apologize. I, I mean, I'm, I agree with you. But, but since we're going to live together and production is how long, I would like for you to tell me how in God's name a man can live so long with a woman and yet show no more respect for her than that. What kind of concept do you have for your woman? For, you, for someone that you love. What kind of love is it that would be so heartless? And I lowered the boom. I said one hell of a lot more than that to him, pardon me, Frank. I said an awful lot more to him than that. But in effect, that's what I said. And his reply was, he says, well, as I understand it, you are a student of Western metaphysics. He said, I found a little about you, too, during this time. <laughs> he says, as I understand it, you're a student of Western metaphysics. And I said, yes. And he says, well, then you, and he says, and, and you wouldn't consider yourself a religious man. A religious man. And I said, yes. Yeah. I think God is, 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 you know, that there is some grand design that is considerably more than appears on the scene. And, and he looked at me, and uh, though I'm not sure that I can get the words precisely right, he looked at me and he said, you then of all people, of all people, should know. That my actions now are not a disregard for life or a callousness of my life, but rather my actions are a disregard for an illusion called death. And I'm living that disregard for it. I'm not professing it. I'm not theorizing about it. I'm living it. Of course, there are many stories, many stories told of what appears to be, what appears to be the fact that death is only an illusion. Many stories are told about it. It's said in many ways. Every culture, every religion, every philosophy has something to say about it. Well, either you believe it or you don't believe it. And here was a man I found that, well, he believes it. And so not only does he believe it, but he's going to live his belief. You know, there's a tremendous difference between intellectualizing and then doing what, you, what this that is, knowing something and, and, and living what that knowing allows one to do. There is one thing to see that freedom is man's natural estate, and another thing to live it. Now, consequently, I have a great, great delight and regard for these young people, and now many, many old, who are coming to see that why should we profess perfection and freedom? not living. And so, while we may not approve of the way some of them are living, at least we see that it's a step. And on the human scene, as it's put, a journey of 10,000 miles starts with a single step. So these kids are living in a sense of freedom in many, in many ways. They're coming out from under what appears to be the binds and the restraints and restrictions of rules and regulations that have not really performed, have not done what they had promised to do. 2,000 years ago, Christianity said, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Well, how much rest do you see among all of the Christians as they... I'm not pointing fingers now. I'm just across the board looking at all of the religions of the world. Please understand that this awareness right here, right now, includes all of the religions of the world, all of the philosophies, all of the concepts. And so when I talk about one, I'm only talking about an aspect of this self-I. I'm not lowering the boom on anybody. 
But if you look out and see how, how many, how much rest do you really see among all of the church-going people? How much rest? Now, true, there's a lot of comfort there. There's a lot of beauty there. But when you, has, has the so-called institution produced, it's, has, it, has it accomplished its so-called mission? You know, if instead of peace, they were selling soap, bars of soap, and the industry had been about the business for 2,000 years trying to sell these bars of soap and sold so few. One in a thousand, two in 10,000 actually finally buy the bar of soap and see it and feel it and make use of it. What would have happened to the industry? It would have folded long ago because somebody would have said, gee whiz, something, something is amiss, something is wrong. And look at Judaism. 5,000 years ago, it began with the statement, Thou shalt have no other God before me. And for 5,000 years, it's been working on the sale of the Ten Commandments. And if you just look around, just to look at the tangible scene, how many do you see practicing the Ten Commandments? So therefore, it has failed to sell its product. Well, all of these things were the things that I pondered and wondered about and traveled all around the world looking for to get the answers, and I understand now why this traveling is going on, and I think it's great. I resolved that if this man could have looked in the face of such a tragedy and could in, in, in Ten days or thereabouts, be filled with glee and delight, and still have people flocking around and feeling the joy that he was, the peace he was. Well, I thought, well, now here's a man that's got something to say to me, and I'll learn his secret. Well, he was my interpreter for a long time. And I went back. When the war was over, I went back to China to study with him. All in all, I lived with him for a little more than three years. He was, I, by terminology, he was a Taoist. But I've studied with many, many, so we don't think that this is the only instruction. Uh, but he was a Taoist, withdrawn from what appeared to be the organizational aspect of it because he said, gee whiz, you can't take truth and strain it through a sieve. After all, the sun seems to shine on all kinds of trees. It shines on the ones that are not necessarily straight, but the ones that are bent over too. And it seems to shine on the ones that are small as well as the ones that are big. And uh, I can't, he said, believe that just because, uh, unless one is a Taoist, that he will never find nirvana or perfection or peace. And then I began, again, a very serious study of Western metaphysics. As I came back, I saw that the thing that seemed to me to most merely point out all that I had learned during this period of time was Christian science, because at least here was a philosophy that did not try to make a great big man on a white throne somewhere, that said that God was was an immutable principle that was everything. It was spirit, it was love, it was life, life itself, truth. And this seemed to me to be infinitely better than anything that I could find on the scene where I was. I was still a soldier. All right, now, if I'm talking too much about Bill, from this point on, if you will, every time I say I, and speak of an I experience, please put yourself there in lieu of it. Because I tell you a very simple truth, that what you hear right now is yourself. What you see is yourself. The one out there is yourself. Even though we label it, name it, even the government, we see that we that want to improve, even the, uh, the world that we see that we would want to improve is I, identity. It's included here is I. Now, if all of you will just take just a second, take a big old deep breath and relax and 
come down from this heavy, heavy hanging on my word. Because the word's got nothing to do with it. Nothing, nothing, nothing to do with it. Okay, just take it. Just relax, please, and sit easy, sit easy. Because I'll tell you something now that, that is the point that the young kids seem to have seen in many respects. Especially those that want to include truth in their search. They want to include and not exclude an overriding underwriting eternal principle as being somewhere included in the scene. They seem to see it. And they see it more quickly than the older people do simply because it hasn't been covered over with this grand veneer of trying to make a living and contend and battle our way through the thicket. Now listen, listen yet. Let me show you why the world is really who and what you are and not separate and apart from it. Right now, what is it that hears these sounds? What hears these sounds? What hears these sounds? What? What, in all honesty, right now, what hears these sounds? What sees, what sees the one called Bill up here leaning against a beautiful piece of furniture? What sees these sounds? What hears these sounds? Obviously. I was given 28 days to answer this question in the old Alice tradition. The question is asked, you spend 28 days in study and contemplation and wandering around from pole to pole. The mother physician just reads the book, boy, reads it, reads it, reads it, puts that one down, reads another one. Somebody told me about a fellow who for two years, every day, read another book. One book a day for two years in order to read all the truth there was. It's better to read one book a hundred times than it is to read a hundred, hundred books one. My thing. But right now, right now, what hears these sounds? The laughter of children in the distance in the sound of dogs barking and all right what hears these sounds what sees these sights if it isn't simple consciousness or life itself life life itself life itself or consciousness or as i like i was looking for a new word to use i said awareness one that had not been used so often and hadn't become so trite and so stuck and nailed down by the sundry establishments and institutions and philosophies and religions. I used the term awareness. But what is it if it isn't awareness right now that is being awake? Awareness right now listens and hears Bill. Awareness right now thinks. Awareness right now feels feelings. Isn't it? What is it, what is it that uh, if you were to stick a pen, you know, in, in, in your finger, what would feel the pain? What would feel the sharp prick? What would see the sight of blood? Awareness. Awareness. If you were to, uh, well, right, right now it includes a very beautiful room, a very lovely home. What sees the beautiful room and feels the feeling in it? It's awareness doing it. Where is the image, the form, the shape, or whatever you call it, or the piece of furniture called piano? It's within awareness. Within awareness. It is seen within awareness. What, what you really see here are a lot of qualities and attributes, nothing but qualities and attributes that you name, have, have labeled piano. For example, you see shape or form, but there's no piano in that shape or form. There's that shape that you see form. You see, but there's no piano itself in that form. You see color, but there's no piano itself in the thing called color. Color is a quality or an attribute. Form is a quality or an attribute. Wow. 
right? You hear sounds, and sounds are wavelengths, vibrations, but where are they perceived? Within awareness itself, right? These qualities and attributes are seen and perceived within awareness itself. You, you uh, see a green leaf here. If you were to feel it and touch it, you would feel texture. You would feel, say, smooth. But there's no leaf itself in smooth. There's no leaf itself in, in softness. And so if you'll just stop and think, every form that's ever perceived is just a whole bunch of qualities and attributes. It might be, you might be one of them is color, one of them is malleability perhaps, or tensile strength, but all of these things are just qualities and attributes, but there is no isness itself in any of those qualities or attributes. And yet we will look out at a certain form and we then give it a big name like piano or man or woman or blanket or bird or world or government. And yet where is everything seen? Every one of those qualities or attributes, where is it ever seen? Where is the only place it's ever seen? Within. This awareness sits away right here, right now. This awareness sits away right here, right now. Where have you ever seen the one called husband? Daughter. Friend. School. Government. Where have you ever seen it? Within this one, not another, within this one. This one. Now, yeah, we can say, yeah, but my wife, boy, she's got her own ideas. Yeah, but where do you see the wife? And where do you see what appear to be other ideas that she's got? Within this one. And you can say, yeah, but I got a history professor that is hellfire. He wants me to memorize everything in the cotton picking book as if, as if memorizing all of that stuff is supposed to mean something to me. But where do you see the one called the history professor? Where do you hear the words? Where do you see the book? Where do you do the so-called memorizing? Where do you read the words? Where do you feel the pages of the book? If not within this awareness, that's where I'm right here, right This awareness. Not somebody else's awareness. Your own. The awareness that one says is I. You stop and think about history. <clears throat> you know, go back to the to the pre words, the era before words, which must have been the greatest era of all. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> there isn't a single pebble or rock that you can't pick up right now that didn't exist, or a grain of sand, or a drop of water. That it didn't exist before the first word ever came into being. Where do you see it if you go back into history? Where do we think of the, the great movements that came along? Where? But within this awareness, right? Where have we ever heard of the invention of the weed except within this awareness, right? This awareness, not another. Where has all of the study of history and past movements and events, where has it produced? Taking place for them, this is what it's right. Not another, not somebody else. And if you were to start naming the figures of history and how great they were and what they did and didn't do, what Abraham Lincoln meant to this country, what Karl Marx has done with his philosophy. What seems to be going on in, in the Vatican or in Boston? Where, where, where have you ever seen or heard or felt or known about any of those concepts? Always would be this Never have we ever been concerned with another single awareness. This one. Here is us. Now, it's true, we look out at the images out there and we get all wrapped up in them and what they're doing or not doing, what they're feeling or not feeling, the way they're acting or not acting, what we would like to have them do or not do. 
But all the while, we're still looking out at an aspect of the self we are here in time. Isn't this true? What is awareness if it isn't life itself? What is awareness? I mean, when we say we are alive, what do we mean? We mean I am awake. Awareness right here, right now, is the first indisputable and only unarguable point that, that, that you can study. There is no question but what awareness is aware right here, right now. Looking out at an aspect of itself that it sees as forms and images as, with a name, a label hung on it, called Bill, making sounds, if you're listening to your own sound. If you identify as aware, you're listening to your own self. If you identify as a life, awareness, you're looking at your own self. If you identify as awareness, you're feeling your own feeling. You're not capable of, of absorbing the so-called feeling of another. You realize what a ridiculous concept that was. Where did that ever come from? That I can. Also, if you identify as awareness, you can see suddenly that the authority lies here as awareness, and not out there with the image that's in it. The authority lies with the awareness that sees the form, and it doesn't lie out there with the image that appears to be trying to lower the boom, or with the dollar bill that appears to just a piece of paper, you know, with a number on it. Or most often, most often, this thing that the financial institute, the lifeblood of the, this thing out that we see within awareness called the financial institution, this thing called the financial institution, where has it ever been perceived except within awareness? And all that constitutes its lifeblood called gold or money, where has it been conceived or seen or known or understood except within this awareness right here? Now, the question is very simple. Where does the authority lie? With awareness or with the image of its within? It's as if, it is as if suddenly, and this is the great religious experience that follows me around. It is when what I am. It is man's great and sudden new discovery of an identity that he is that is infinitely greater than a bunch of fingers and toes and pumps and brain cells and lobes and hair and water and all of that, an identity infinitely greater than that. It's the discovery of an infinite identity that is already pure and perfect on the scene about the business of discovering itself. Now, I have no other story to tell except to point out that awareness itself is the identity of one. And that if we would get to the root of what seemed to be our trials and tribulations, our lack of dollars, our lack of security, our lack of a government that should be what it is, our lack of education as it should be, Whatever the appearance, if we would get to the root of it, we'd come home and discover identity here as I first, where it's dominion. And we see that we get the beam out of this eye before we worry about the moat out there. We realize suddenly that heretofore we have identified as an image on a television picture tube, so to speak. And on this television picture tube there are many images, some of them called churches, some of them called schools, some of them called dollars, some of them called husbands, wives, some of them called a billion different things. We've identified as one of those images on there by the name of Bill or by the name of John or Mary. And we did all of this for a reason. I won't go into all of that. There's a reason for it. But all of a sudden, we 
discover that awareness is infinitely more than that. That identity is infinitely more than just that little speck in time and space. But awareness is the picture too. Because isn't this awareness right here, right now, who and what I am? Is not this awareness right here, right now? Is it not all inclusive? Have you ever been outside it? Have you ever seen anything but this awareness? Have you ever heard a sound but this awareness? Have you ever heard of anybody in all history? Have you ever seen a star anywhere within the immensity of the universe that wasn't perceived within this awareness? Has there ever been a thought that was not this awareness? Suddenly we see that identity is this awareness, which is the whole picture to it. And we cease identifying with that poor, miserable little speck in space, beset by trials and tribulations and the weight of the world on its shoulder, trying to correct everything that comes along, trying to make over the universe, as Lao Tzu put it, the world is a perfect vessel and we will try to improve it. Jesus put it, perfection is even now spread over the whole face of the earth, but men see it not. So identity shifts, and, and this can happen right here, right now, because it's already happened right here. Suddenly, we see that identity is this infinite perception that's going on. Perception is who I am. Vision is who I am. Awareness is who I am. Within which all things appear, and I am the appearing of all things. To use the analogy of the television set, instead of being that little image that has to contend with other images wherein time and space are involved, we see a greater identity, which is the whole picture too. And awareness is in It's boundless, it's endless, it had no beginning. Have no end. Now that doesn't do away with this body. One second. There still seems to be a body that you put clothes on. You still brush your teeth, or and you still comb your hair, and you still that body does all kinds of little things, and you still are not unaware of a body. Awareness includes that too, it, but it then sees all bodies as itself. Lo and behold, we look out and suddenly we see that, gee whiz, if awareness is who I am, then everybody and everything I see is what I am. But the authority lies here as I am, not out there as that. Not out there as that dollar bill or out there as that institution or out there as anything else. The authority is here as I, as it was put by Moses. <laughs> and I suppose today should be the appropriate day to say it. And God gave man dominion over every creeping thing that creepeth upon him. And behold, everything is good. temptation, once this point has been seen, it's to keep falling back into the little limited narrow sense of self and continue and to go on continuing the sights and the sounds out there. To fall back into the belief that we are just a speck in space and that they can lead us around by the nose and tell us to do this and that and the other thing. But the remarkable thing is that we find out that if, you, if when we live as awareness is in, and test this now, awareness, you'll find out that the dominion really is here. And if there, that, you, that much that appears to be the authority out there is really just a paper tiger, to use, unfortunately, to use that expression. I suppose it's unfortunate that I should use such an expression. But it really is. The body that appears to be malfunctioning. <coughs> Why? So a body is malfunctioning. So what? Awareness is malfunctioning. Suddenly it's as if we were, instead of identified as a leaf on a tree, we identify as the whole tree and all the leaves are who and what we are. 
suddenly we look out and we see that all people are our brothers, to put it that way. And that to criticize and condemn or lower the boom on anyone out there, to call them good or bad, is to only lower the boom and condemn some aspect of the self I am. To say that somebody out there is guilty is to call myself guilty. To say that somebody out there is destroying something is to say I'm destroying. And I know full well that awareness is not about the goodness of doing itself in. 